Welcome back to the Upstate Coffee Collective podcast. Happy Monday. Hope you're having a great start to your week. Um, This week, we're going to talk about coffee. We're going to talk about all kinds of coffee, starting as a barista, going all the way to the farms themselves, and as Kevin says, getting your hands dirty. Um, We talked to Kat Melheim, who is a prominent figure in the coffee community these days, and she's a super friendly, super interesting, super supportive part of this coffee community that we do have. Um, Kat Melheim is the creator of Coffee People Zine, which is a print magazine for coffee people who create art. It's a really powerful representation of the collective um, passions and emotions and intellectual and spiritual journeys of our coffee people. Um, we've had her on the podcast before, uh, earlier on, probably within the first like 10 or 15 episodes we had her on to talk about her zine. We touch on it a little bit again, but we actually focus very much on her nine and a half week trip to Hawaii. It started off as, uh, just a couple of days, maybe seven days to nine days. Um, but she got the opportunity to stay and to, take part in um, grafting coffee trees and we'll get into what that means Um, and really just being at the farm level producing coffee in Hawaii on the big island Um, it's a really interesting story because somebody as you know well-traveled and adventurous as Kat found herself in an unfamiliar place um, meeting new people and trying new things in coffee. She came home with a lot of insights, a better understanding of the challenges we face as a coffee community from the farm level. And we touch on really just a a lot of that. Um, we also talk about fermentation a little bit. Um, we are all kind of gaga for fermented coffees right now. Uh, almost so much so that it's a little bit of a, of a meme. Um, I certainly love natural coffees as much as the next guy. And then we talk about the usual suspects, uh, music and what kind of coffee we're drinking. Um, and also the, the strength of your dollar as a consumer, um, almost as being almost as strong as your vote. We really have to remember that as consumers, as, um, the people on the buying end of the spectrum, our dollar means a lot because it's what every company and corporation is looking for at the end of the day. Um, so where you decide to use that money has a, a giant impact overall on the direction that companies go um, and the types of people that make a difference in the world and have opportunities to empower others. So, yeah, a uh, really fresh, exciting human conversation that we have with a good friend of ours, a super inspiring uh, entrepreneur in our space. So I hope you enjoy. Listeners of this podcast can save 10% on a bag of all day ADK. Uh, just use the code podcast at checkout. And don't forget that we have a few more bags of our highlight roast left. It's a double fermented Katura coffee from Colombia, roasted by our good friends at Stacks Espresso Bar. Every Highlight Roast package comes with um, a bunch of educational resources surrounding that coffee and the people that touch that coffee. We do unreleased podcast interviews with the roaster as well as the producers, uh, Shuddy and Elias Bider, who run El Vergal Estates in Colombia. So these packages are really, really for those people who love, love, love coffee and want to take the experience of drinking coffee beyond the cup and really get a feel for what makes their coffee special. Um, again, there's only a handful of packages left. If you want to grab one, they're on our website, uh, upstatecoffeecollective.com. If you have any questions about anything coffee related, please feel free to DM us on Instagram. Send us an email at hello at upstatecoffeecollective.com. We are your buddies. We're your coffee bros. Come say hi. We really appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please uh, think about giving us a positive rating and telling your friends about us. Word of mouth is a really great way to get our podcast into more people's libraries. We love you. We appreciate you. Kill it this week. Spring is here. 
enjoy the weather and enjoy this conversation with Kat Melheim of Coffee People Zine. Welcome back to the Upstate Coffee Collective podcast. My name is Matt Pfeiffer. My co-host is Kevin Miner. Whoop. Today we have a return guest, uh, one of our good friends, Kat Melheim, uh, creator of Coffee People Zine. And yeah. oh uh, gosh, you have like two or three different Instagram handles, right? You've got Roaster Cat. That's true. Coffee Cat. The multifaceted. <laughs> yeah, I have too, I have too many things, probably too many Instagrams going on. But uh, <laughs> yeah, hello. Hello and good morning. Hello. Good morning. We just covered how you are. But, you know, there is a uh, there is a preliminary question that we ask all of our guests. You might be familiar because you are uh, you're one of our few returning guests and we're really excited to have you. But for the people who don't know what you're about, uh, who maybe haven't heard our original episode with you, we've got a uh, a question of three. Who are you? How are you? What do you do? That's great. Well, it's good to be back. Who am I? I am Kat Melheim. Uh, how am I? I'm great. I'm a little bit sleepy as well, uh, but feeling feeling good, drinking some coffee. Uh, what do I do? Well, I do a host of, of different things, um, but as you said, I run Coffee People Zine, which is a print publication for the creatives in the coffee world. I'm also a roaster and have been a barista, manager, educator, all-around coffee person. Um, and what else do I do? I was just living on a coffee farm in Hawaii, so I was a coffee farm hand for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, I do a bunch of Instagram things, running social media for myself and for the uh, for Coffee People Zine. Um, I host a like a recurring TV show on the slow pour supply Instagram where I basically interview my friends uh, and we have chats. Um, I do consulting, freelance writing, uh, traveling. I like to eat a lot. Um, I like to drink coffee. I like to create art. Yeah. I, I like to be with people. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you're in good company then because that's we love to do all those things as well. That's why I was like, yeah, heck yeah, I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, I, w I was going to throw down, um, you know, it's funny. You say that you run Coffee People Zine for like the creatives of the coffee world, but I just hear like for the coffee world because there's so, like everyone in the coffee world that at least that I've met, uh, everyone has some form of creativity or expression about them. Like it's something about coffee draws creative people to it totally well yeah, yeah when i was starting the zine um initially i started it yeah like i said for the creatives of the coffee world or co for creative coffee people um, but i've really realized so background if people haven't um, heard of it before or haven't listened to our past episode the zine is full of submissions by folks who work in and around the coffee industry uh, so like baristas roasters um anybody who works in coffee can submit work, um, art, poetry, photography, music, uh, you know, any creations. Um, but what I r quickly realized is that people who, like regulars to the coffee shops that were carrying the zine got super into it too. Um, because a lot of times people who are graphic designers or freelance writers or whatever also congregate at coffee shops because that's a place to work. Um, it's mm -hmm. a, you know, nice environment to, to get stuff done in. And yeah, like you said, creatives just kind of, kind of, uh, commune around a <laughs> shared cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there is also, um, in the, in the zine, if you don't work in coffee, you can also contribute to the zine as long as, uh, your contribution is about coffee if you don't work in it. But yeah, it's yeah. for, it's for everybody. Really? Yeah. One question I kind of wanted to get out of uh, the way specifically about your time in Hawaii. Were, were you technically woofing out there? Was that like a woofing experience? 
technically I was not because okay. the farm I was on was not an organic farm and I uh, didn't do it through a like bigger organization. Like woofing, you have to, as a p- individual, you have to sign up through their site. Um, mm-hmm. I think you have to pay like a, an annual membership fee and then organic farms can sign up and they have to pay a membership fee and then you're kind you can like, you know, browse kind of like a, uh, I don't know, yeah. like a, a, Airbnb. Yeah, they yeah, they pay a fee to be cataloged and then other people pay a fee to be able to peruse the catalog. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the place that I was at is not an organic farm and they're not on um the woofing website. And I wasn't on the woofing website. I basically just came upon them uh because I initially went to Hawaii to visit a friend of mine uh, mm-hmm. who I've been meaning to visit for a while and um <laughs> The winter in Minnesota, I'm sure, as in uh, where you guys are in upstate, <laughs> it, it's not super pleasant. Um, so I had been meaning to visit this friend who moved out there just before COVID. And um, the winter here was was getting to me in ways that uh, were not super, like, you know, sustainable. I was not doing super well. Um, and I was just like, okay, flights to Hawaii are super cheap. Um, I can, like, go and at least be on, like, at least be in warm weather. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I just decided to go out there. So I was out there for three weeks staying with a friend of mine. And I kind of, as I do, I just started, like, talking with people. And I went to the, like, the coffee shop that I wanted to go to. And um, it was, it's called Paradise Coffee Roasters, Mm -hmm. um, was the first, like, the shop that I went to. And I met the owner. His name is Miguel Mesa. And um, basically just like had a conversation with him and he is like next level coffee experimentation, fermentation. Mm. Uh, he also owns an exporting company. And, but I was just like, ca- like captivated by his mind. Cause I could tell he was just kind of on another level. And so mm-hmm. one day I was like, Hey, can like, if, if you're going around, my friend was, had to go to work. I was like, Hey Miguel, if you're going around today, like, or this week, can I just like come with you like around to the coffee things that you're doing? And he was basically like, yeah, that's fine. (laughs) And so so I like went around with him one day and just like rode around in his car, basically around the entire uh, big island. And um, we ended up going to this one coffee farm called Kona Farm Direct, which is the one that I ended up um, working at and met the met the farmer and through a series of conversations, he mentioned that it was really hard to find workers and he had a lot of uh, grafting to do, which is a specific, uh, he owns a nursery. So he had, had some stuff to do, but he didn't have enough time and didn't have anyone to do it. And I was like, I can do that. Like mm. I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to leave next weekend. So if I can find a place to stay, I'll come do that work. And um, he, his wife, uh, was there at the time and she was like well we have a spare bedroom and so anyway that's oh, how, that's how I came to uh, stay in Hawaii for nine and a half weeks when I originally went there for three <laughs> that's great and well and then you ended up doing grafting I assume which is a super interesting process um, it, I assume it's similar in co- I, I have never heard of someone doing well obviously it makes sense that people graft in coffee as well could you describe that pro- process for listeners yeah for sure it's really really fascinating um so most like commercially grown food is mm-hmm. grafted like so uh, it happens a lot in apples which are you know grown in upstate um so i have one literally right here that i'm going to eat when we're done talking <laughs> I love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, so what what you do when you graft is you take the root stock of a of a plant, whatever, like well, let's, not, let's say apples. Um, you take a root stock of apples that is really hardy and um, is like it isn't affected by nematodes or fungus or um, the things that basically destroy roots. Um, and then you take the top of the tree that is really tasty. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So like whatever apples you want to grow, Um, because oftentimes uh, trees with the like really hardy roots don't grow the best fruit and Mm -hmm. the trees that grow the best fruit 
don't are are kind of weak in the yeah. root system. So mm-hmm. you take the strong root system and you put the tasty fruit on top, and then you have a hearty tree that grows tasty fruits. So like with coffee, uh, we were taking Liberican roots, which is a uh, like one of the so it's not arabica, it's not robusta. Um, it's its own branch on the coffee tree. Mm-hmm. Um, and Liberican fruit is really not great. It's like, it's terrible. It's really inconsistent. Um, it's not good. So you take the, like when the plant is really, really tiny, um, like basically, a, a well, for the rootstock, you take it when it's, I think maybe nine months old. Okay. I, I was only there for a couple of weeks, so I don't, I didn't see like the entire, entire process, but, mm. um, when the, when the plant is still little, like, let's say, we'll say like 12 to 18 inches. Okay. Um, you cut, basically cut the top off. So all you're left with is the root. And then you take a little sprout of a really, really tasty, like coffee top. So mm. we were using geisha, or they also have um, mocha, and they have K7, they have Guatemalan mm-hmm. Tipica, uh, mm-hmm. and you you cut the top off of a little tiny sprout, and then you clip them together. It's like literally like a little binder clip, mm-hmm. and you just like, so there's like a, you know, you cut the top off the bottom, so there's a, a hole or like a, a wound, basically, and you cut the bottom off the top, <laughs> this is mm-hmm. all very confusing, uh, <laughs> And so then there's like a wound and you put those together, use a binder clip and then they grow together. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of have where the stem would begin Yes. from the root system. And then you have where the stem technically ends and would be jutting into the ground on the actual plant part. And you're, you're technically like you're a term that some people might misuse here as a misnomer is splicing. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you're, what you're doing is you're essentially just, you're giving a plant that might not be as hardy a better chance. And it's really interesting that plants want to find each other in that way and can graft because like grafting is, you know, a transplant and a human is a much more complex process, but grafting right. in plants is relatively uh, simple. Yeah. 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 And you don't have to use any glue. You don't have to do any sort of like, yeah, you don't have to put anything on there. They do. They just want to, they just want to grow. The tops still want to thrive. So yep. the bottoms uh, feed, feed it. And yeah, it's, it's nuts That's how amazing. easily it does. Right. Isn't that cool? Um, yeah. I had now, no idea. I had no idea you do that in general, like in agriculture. I had no idea yeah. that, that was a thing, but especially like in coffee, that's super cool. It was a, it was a big game changer for when plants started being transplanted to other continents and they had relatives. Like that was a big game changer when it was realized in the agricultural world that you could graft. So um, so quick big picture yeah. question. I, I I am of the I'm the part of the audience that has, you know, little to no idea this existed <laughs> right so uh, but what i'm having like a moment where i'm like you, you know how one of the things that we worry about in coffee is climate change and how it's going to affect you know the growing mm-hmm. coffee all over the world all over the coffee belt is grafting mm-hmm. something that people are experimenting with to use like hardier uh hardier mother plants or hardier uh cultivars in order to potentially combat the effects of climate change to make coffee grow better in less preferable regions? That's a really great question. And I would say I don't entirely know, but I do know that grafting isn't widespread in coffee. Mm -hmm. Um, It's widespread in other sectors of agriculture, but in coffee, it's still relatively new. So I think there's a huge, huge opportunity to experiment with that, um, especially as yeah, like you said, climate change, seasons change, the seasonality of everything is kind of getting upended. So if there's a rootstock that is that can uh, transfer or maybe more drought resistant, mm-hmm. um, it might be more, uh, it, it, we can utilize that more in places where <laughs> drought is happening more. Mm. Yep. Or even even resistance to La Roya or, or coffee rust for, for those who don't. The, like, so La Roya um, coffee rust, that's actually like becoming a really big thing in Hawaii right now. Um, mm-hmm. It was just discovered on the big island 
in October for the first time. Oh, no. And so, yeah, Whoa. it's, it's pretty bad. So they haven't, um, they haven't even had a, like a wet season, a summer season with it yet. So the farmers oh, like that I was talking to are really scared because <clears throat> it could, it could totally decimate the Hawaiian coffee growing. Um, yeah. but yeah, so the, uh, the coffee leaf rust does, it attacks the leaves. So it doesn't so much like the, the root system isn't affected by it. It attacks okay. the leaves. Um, but they are experimenting with different, you know, um, with different root, uh, sorry, coffee tree tops. Mm -hmm. um, but right now in, in Hawaii, most coffees are a, like der derived from a Guatemalan Tipica, which is really susceptible to the coffee leaf rust. So most trees right now that are there are like <laughs> sitting ducks. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just waiting and it's, oh, it's no. a bit scary. Yeah. Aww. Um, now uh, quick, one more question about the grafting with this. Uh, you said you were grafting, um, specifically you mentioned geisha and that's like a that's like a buzzword for a lot of people right now um and obviously he's you know the the farmer is doing that because he wants to sell coffee to people who want coffee and a lot of people ask for that by name right now um is this a form of grafting though that he's done before has he already done this successfully and seen the results and that's why he was like okay that's what we're going to graft onto these liberica roots yeah, totally. Okay, cool. So the the farmer that I was staying with, Miguel Mesa is the guy who owns Paradise Coffee Roasters. He's the mm -hmm. one that I went around with. Um, Craig Lee is the name of the farmer that I was okay. staying with uh, at Kona Farm Direct. And he mm -hmm. has been working in coffee for 27 years. Like Whoa. he's he's been there. He uh, initially bought a coffee farm 27 years ago um, and then just like he, he was – just an agriculture guy and then realized how awesome coffee was basically and fell in love with with coffee and grew yeah. coffee for a while and then uh, transitioned into mostly being a nursery operation uh, because oh, cool. not a whole lot of other people were doing it and yeah. he as far mm -hmm. as I can tell he's kind of at the front end of like coffee nursery operations in Hawaii. Um, not a lot of other people are using Gesha or K7 or Mocha or Kefa mm. or so like all of these are different varietals that I'm, that mm. are not usually used in Hawaii. Um, there's kind of a, it seems from my time there again, like I was only there for a short time. So I, this is all just from my observations, but it seems like there's kind of an old guard in Hawaii with people who have been growing coffee uh. for decades who are like, you know, Kona coffee, Hawaii coffee is yep. a Guatemalan tip like Guatemalan Tipica. It has this flavor profile. It tastes like this. Anything else we like shouldn't be called Hawaiian coffee shouldn't be called yeah. Kona coffee um, <laughs> because it isn't wow. what it has been. So he's mm. kind of like mm. he and then Miguel uh, and folks over at Hula Daddy. Uh, they're a, another farm. They're kind of, they're, they're folks that I was around. They're kind of pushing the envelope in terms of like, well, we're going to bring in some of these other things. And of course there are other people as well uh, on the island, but they're kind of, they're kind of rogues in the yeah. in the world at the at the moment. Well, yeah, bringing in it, the new the new stuff and the grafting is. I think Craig is pretty much the only person, at least that I know, who's doing grafting on yeah. uh, the island. Um, so he's yeah, he's kind of a rogue farmer dude, just doing what he thinks is interesting, what he thinks will work. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so with the grafting, he has grafted for himself he has five acres he's grafted mm -hmm. for himself over the past uh, number of years and kind of experimented with what works and what doesn't and um mm -hmm. tries stuff on his own farm and then if it works then yeah he'll he'll do it for other people um and so yeah there are a couple of other farms now that are realizing that he <laughs> that he has 
that he, <laughs> he can has the them. key. <laughs> yeah. <Wow>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if Laroya becomes an issue, uh, you know, another factor of this is like when you're running a nursery, oftentimes you have plants that are isolated from the outer environment. So like he could potentially, you know, just looking at the possibility of factors in play here, he could potentially become the person who ends up, you know, in the future worst case scenario, saving a lot of people and their coffee crops of the future. Yeah. That's really cool. Hopefully it won't come to that, but I'm sure that he, uh, yeah, hopefully he's, he's prepared or trying to get there anyway. Yeah. There's always like a weird moment when you're saying something like that. Like I'm not wishing disaster upon this. <laughs> However, if it happens, yeah. this, this is what I can like piece together in my mind based on pattern. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I went to, um, so I went to, uh, Kona rainforest, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, Kona Rainforest Coffee. They're the biggest, I think, organic farm on uh, the Big Island. And um, yeah, their place is beautiful. They're, they've got like acres and acres and acres of just the most gorgeous trees. But um, there isn't really any organic fungicides that work against Laroya. And um, so I was talking with the farmer, uh, farmers, a husband and wife couple, and they like started tearing up just thinking about the potential for literally all of their trees. I mean, yeah, coffee leaf rust, especially when it hits the first time, can decimate mm -hmm. like nine, Gosh. eighty to 90% percent loss of yeah. coffee trees. Um, they they started tearing up because they were like, you know, we've spent decades building this place up, and it's it could be all gone in the matter of months. Yeah. It's like what happened in the wine world. Um, and that was worldwide. And that's why now you have terms like old world wine and new world wine. It's because there was a global pandemic of plants. And, you know, the after effects of that were that not many people had the original wine stock. And grafting actually helped save wine as a culture. So, yeah, wow. pretty much all yeah. wine, uh, as far as I know, is grafted. There's there's very small amount of old world wine left. Yes, <laughs> I forget exactly where it's from because I'm like, I haven't drank in a long time, but <laughs> I used to talk about this on a weekly basis, but I don't anymore. <laughs> yeah, um, you guys are blowing my mind right now. I got to be honest. With you. <laughs> it's a whole other realm, man. Agriculture um, is so, so incredibly complex and like nuanced and yeah. and I just you know it's one of those things that as a consumer in a consumer country you just don't pay attention to because you just go to the grocery store or <laughs> at best the farmer's market and you yep. you buy things that are already made and you don't have to worry about how they were grown you know how the farmers uh, mm -hmm. protect themselves from you know uh, insects uh, infestation of bacteria or mm -hmm. you know um, plant disease natural disasters <laughs> so cool that's one of the reasons that I was super excited to go to Hawaii because I've worked in you know I started as a barista I kind of did a whole the whole seed to cup in my uh, in my career only backwards <laughs> like, yeah. but that, that's seed. part of the reason that I yeah yeah like being a barista and then being a roaster I'm like okay I've got a handle on these aspects of coffee, but like, let me see the the beginnings of it. And I've been to origin countries before and been on coffee farms before, but had never worked on one. So yeah, when the opportunity to graft came up, I was like, heck yes, I want to do this and yeah, yeah, learn more about, you know, what goes on on a, a daily, weekly basis of, again, of course, I was only there for a couple months. Um, so there's a whole, I didn't, I didn't see like full harvest or anything. Yeah. Um, but being there and being around Craig with his 27 years of experience, like, you know, I, I just learned things just by being around him and just by hearing him talk and hearing him talk to other farmers that mm -hmm. like I couldn't, you, I couldn't have ever learned by yeah. not being there. I'm, I'm hearing you kind of walk yourself back and say like, disclaimer, I was only there for this long, but you were there for eight or nine weeks longer than most people in any consuming country have ever been at, you know, a producing area. So, you, you know, we have to take that as si still significant, you know? That's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. And the funny thing is, um, well, one funny thing I suppose is that, uh, like you keep men mentioning mm. producing countries and previous to going to Hawaii, I always forget that Hawaii is part of the United States. Like the U S oh, yeah. is a producing country in Hawaii, but like yeah. it's, you know, I, 
I always forget that. And that's something that really uh, like my eyes were opened when I was there. Cause mm. yeah, we, it's just like something I never really think about. Like, Oh no, the United States does produce coffee. It's called Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I did. I also wanted to like point out like there's, you know, I'm not here to qualify different people's experiences, but it definitely seems like you've gotten a lot out of this experience because there's a big difference between going to origin and cupping, you know, and then walking around and kind of like, you know, verbally receiving the information and literally getting your hands dirty, <laughs> you know. Um, so are, are there I'm really curious. What are some of the big takeaways that you've had from this, you know, going from Hawaii back to the continental U.S., specifically, you know, landlocked Minnesota and like like what what have you brought back with you? Wow, that is a very good question. I I certainly brought back a desire to return. <laughs> I, want, I want to get back there ASAP. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I feel like it's going to take a while to really digest and understand everything that I learned because, mm-hmm. kind of like you like you mentioned, yeah, not a lot of people have had this experience or this opportunity, and sometimes I forget that. Like I I have this tendency to just kind of assume that things that I've done other people understand too. Like, I think we all have that. Actually, I can't, I was listening to a podcast the other day talking about different, like, um, uh, like cognitive fallacies. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's just like a built in human thing where we just assume that other people have had the experiences that we've had, understand things the way that we understand them. So I think that it's, it's going to take me a while to really like realize and recognize the all of the bits that I got just by being there that other people don't also have. Um, but yeah, I think, like you said, getting my hands dirty, um, like just learning how to graft, why we graft, the mm-hmm. severity and the emotional impact of the coffee leaf rust coming up, I think is is something that um, I didn't really fully grasp before. Yeah. Um, also like the way that the Hawaiian coffee industry works is completely different than basically every other producing region that I know of. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of smallholder farmers. So, I mean, we don't have to get all the way into it, but, uh, in Hawaii and in, in the United States, if you own agricultural land, you get certain tax breaks. And so there are a number of very wealthy people who have small plots of land uh, for their vacation homes. And instead of, if it's just a vacation home, they have to pay a bunch and bunch and bunch of taxes if you have a Mm -hmm. vacation home, if you just have land. If you have agricultural land, uh, you you get a bunch of tax breaks. So there are a lot of wealthy people who buy land for their own personal use and then have a, quote, coffee farm, plant a couple acres of trees uh, and then get a huge tax break. And mm-hmm. then, so yeah, there, there's that, which I didn't understand before because in most oh, other wow. countries um, and that's not everybody. And that's certainly, that's not the people that I was hanging out with really. Yeah. Um, those, the people who are, who uh, are, you know, fall under that category are often only in Hawaii for a couple months out of the year. Um, mm-hmm. They often don't live there. They, that's just like their vacation home. Um, mm-hmm. So, and then they hire other people to manage their farms and stuff like that. Um, But in most other producing regions, the smallholder farmers are dirt poor, subsistence farmers basically growing what they can on their land to like make it by just Mm -hmm. trying to like, you know, support themselves and their family. Um, So, yeah, that is completely different in Hawaii than anywhere else. Um, Also, Hawaii is an island. So, everything is more expensive there. Um, So like the cost of production, whereas in, you know, most other producing countries is, is, is not usually covered, you know, farmers are struggling. Um, But it's uh, like a couple bucks to $5 cost of production for a pound of green coffee. In Hawaii, it's upwards of 20, $30 a pound green because Mm -hmm. of like, labor is more expensive. Um, 
like fuel is more expensive to mm. uh, like to drive your tractor around. Right. That's actually why well, I, I never I never would have considered that. Um, but that makes so much sense that like like Kevin said, right? Everything is imported because you're on an island. Um, how are, are are so I should first ask, do subsistence <clears throat> coffee, you know, smallholder farmers, do they make a living on coffee? Is that possible? Are people are people paying? Twenty five, thirty dollars green, so that they're that smallholder farmers are covering their costs. Oh yes, yeah. Um, okay. In in Hawaii, yes, um, and yeah, in Hawaii, most of the coffee is sold to tourists. Um, and so I heard this from a couple of people who are actually trying to change the way Kona coffee is is perceived in Hawaiian coffee. So I've mentioned Kona coffee a couple of times. That's a yeah. certain region within Hawaii, but there are other coffee growing regions in Hawaii as well. Kona is just the one that's more well known because it had a really great marketing effort a couple mm -hmm. of decades ago. Yes. Um, so um, yeah, but what I heard from a couple of people is that most Hawaiian coffee is sold to um, tourists who are basically there for a couple of weeks and they want something to bring back to their family and friends. And so they buy a number of bags and, uh, and bring it home. So they're willing to pay $30 a pound, $40 a pound, $50 a pound. Um, because it's, it's like the novelty. It's the, it's the sticker on the bag that says Kona coffee. Yeah. Um, most of them aren't going to be, they're not returning customers and they're not going to you know, they're not going to drink it again, or some of them aren't even going to drink it themselves. They're just getting it to give to people that they know. Yep. Um, so, and also in Hawaii, in contrast to most other growing regions, a lot of the farmers also roast their own coffee. So they'll grow it, process, and most of them don't own a processing plant, but they'll get it processed very close by. Um, and then roast it themselves or pay someone else to roast it and then sell it on their farm or, you know, like mm. sell it to people who come to tours on their farm. Um, or okay. they'll sell it to a bigger company that does tours there as like on their farm. So, so like green. They can sell it. Yeah. 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 Um, so. So that's a different supply chain altogether then, right? It's it's like a. You're just handing instead of selling it three, you know, exchanging hands three, four, five times to get it to, let's say, continental U.S. And some roaster in some, you know, town is roasting it themselves because at that point it would be overwhelmingly expensive because it's basically being bought at origin. Yeah, it, it makes it much more approachable. OK. Yeah. And oh, I should also mention that most of the green coffee that does leave the island is going to Asia, is going to Japan chi and China um, oh, yeah. because they really like love the name Kona coffee. Um, yeah. That's a really big thing in, in Asian countries. So, uh, and a lot of Asian roasters are more willing to pay high prices per pound than U S roasters. So um, yeah. Yeah. It seems that farmers are able to, I mean, not to say that all farmers, especially Hawaiian farmers who like that's their actual main job, you know, like preclude not not the people who are just rich and have money and th thus land <laughs> and wanted to have the land for the tax break. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, but the the people who are truly like farmers as their main job, um, most of them aren't like super rich raking in the the dough, but they're able to make it by. They're able to. Um, able to cover their costs and and keep things going. Um, I think that that is becoming less and less the case, though. Um, mm. I did hear a number of times that, mm. uh, and a, a lot of uh, coffee farmers currently are kind of aging out. Um, they're all of older ages yeah. and aren't able to keep up with their farms. Um, also, work, like getting workers is a big issue. So, uh, like, wow. because Hawaii is an island nation, you know, a lot of agriculture in the U S is supported by, uh, migrant workers coming from, mm -hmm. coming from, um, South central South America. Uh, but 
you have to get on a plane in order to get to Hawaii and it's not as easy to, to get labor. Um, so there's a a labor shortage out there as well, which makes it harder to upkeep a farm operation. Um, if you're, if you're just out there by yourself. I bet. Um, and, you know, we're talk- we're ta- we're touching on a lot of topics that are actually really big in ag- agriculture globally right now. Um, you know, certain farmers aging out and uh, people using farming land for tax breaks. And there, there's a lot of uh, this isn't just in coffee. This is like all across the board. Um, and it's because of the way that essentially, you know, our our increasingly globalized capitalist view of the economy works. And it's because of a lot of the things that have been put into place that make the systems that build up the idea of global capitalism as it affects every single market, including the agrarian market. Um, and I, you know, like it's, it's tough to hear that people's livelihoods are being um, endangered because of that system and those systems that have been put into play. Um, would you, would you say from your experience that uh, some of the farmers out there seem worried about the livelihood of coffee production on the, on their scale? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, And yes, (laughs) certainly. Yeah. Especially, especially from every aspect that you just touched on. (laughs) Well, uh, well, it, just like, and you're obviously, you know, here we are, we're podcasting, like we're in the continental U S and we're talking about Hawaii, but like uh, on a total novice guest, what is something that, uh, you, myself or Matt could do say we, we wanted to purchase coffee from Hawaii and we wanted to make sure that we were doing it responsibly. What is something we on our very small level could do here? Because we're talking about people on a personal level, attempting to affect people on a personal level, you know, and that's very hard to do once you start, you know, speaking with wallets, but yeah. Hmm. Is there any technique to uh, researching where you're getting your coffee from? Or is there, is there anything in place for us yet? And the answer could be no, like uh, (laughs) there might not be something in place for us as consumers yet to help on that level. You know, the only thing that I could say from my personal experience is to purchase from the people that I know, whom I know are doing it right. So Mm -hmm. purchasing from Kona Farm Direct, the farm that I was at, purchasing from Paradise Coffee Roasters. They Mm -hmm. also roast um, other origins as well. Um, Purchasing from... Pacific Coffee Research. That's another. Um, yeah. That's a women-owned business out there. Uh, I'm friends with the the owners, Brit, Brit and Madeline. Hello. Um, Yay. Hula Daddy. Okay. Um, and and I know from from experience and from speaking with them that mm-hmm. they are taking care of of their land and their trees top notch that they're also uh paying fair prices um Mm -hmm. specifically especially craig and um he manages a couple of other farms as well so uh, yeah but i don't know all of their names and that's kona farm direct that's kona farm direct yes he pays a, a premium to his pickers and um like like premium on premium for picking just the red ripe cherries and he's Mm -hmm. really um He's really diligent and conscientious about how he uh, treats the folks that that work for him and that pick um, coffee for him. So that's great. Yeah. So you would say so. Buying direct is kind of like a really good way for us to help out on a consumer level. I guess so. There's not really ways to not buy direct from yeah. Hawaii no. because yeah, like there most most coffee is unless you're getting it from um from asia most coffee is like grown and roasted in hawaii Mm. right that's that yeah yeah, because that circles back to what we were just saying about you know because it's an island you know everything is imported everything is more expensive so Mm -hmm. you're not going to see a lot of kona coffee being sold 
um, outside of Hawaii, everything yeah. is yeah. kind of that's very, that's very yeah. and that's very and it's unique. So expensive green. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. That you're not right. Like Kevin and I aren't going to go pick up a you know what a pound or or you know even a ten pounds of color. right for yeah. thirty five dollars. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. After after you know freight and everything. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, would, I I don't know. Other than that, though, like I mean, um, maybe just like being being aware of Hawaii as a coffee growing region is another mm-hmm. thing to to do. Uh, because again, like I said before, I went out there, I didn't I didn't really think about Hawaii as a coffee growing region, and I think a lot of us on the mainland don't really think about it. Um, probably yeah. because most of the coffee is sold on the island to tourists. So we don't really see, you know, Hawaiian coffee, Kona coffee when we're just going cafe to cafe in our everyday lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so being aware of that is a, a good, a good starting point as well. I'm also yeah. really curious and I didn't really get to see this a lot. Um, but, uh, curious about how the coffee industry has affected native Hawaiians. Um, mm. because so Hawaii, I started doing a little research on the history of Hawaii and it's like such a new state and the United States has like mm-hmm. really kind of been super shitty. Like <laughs> we've, mm-hmm. and like in recent years, like within the past a hundred years, we've really fucked stuff up there. Yeah. Um, and so there's, yeah, I, there, there aren't a lot of, uh, native Hawaiians in the coffee industry. Um, and so I'm curious, I'm curious about learning more about that, but had a hard time really kind of getting into that. But mm. anyway, well, I know Carlos Sims Jr. specifically is on a journey to Hawaii. Yeah. And he's, he's going to Hilo. Yeah. And he really like part of his, his personal mission, like the, the way that he's dedicating himself is he wants to counteract uh you know colonialist behavior and racism Mm -hmm. um which i think is super great and i'm i'm really intrigued to see um the way that he is able to do that uh you know you you were talking about awareness and i think being aware of people like carlos and being aware of the people that you're talking about is one really good way um to purchase more responsibly, but people can also uh, raise their awareness by listening to Kat Melheim talk to her friends on via poor supply. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to make sure to plug that because like, you know, you're talking about awareness and that's one of the things that you do personally in the coffee industry via coffee people zine. You're raising the awareness of the art that's in the coffee world. And when you're talking to people on poor supply, you're raising the awareness of people's experiences in the coffee world. So yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to miss that opportunity. <laughs> oh well, thank thank you for You're plugging welcome. my uh, <laughs> my my show. You're welcome. Yeah, l- listen to me every other Thursday over at um, at Slow Pour Supply. We also save it on their Instagram story, so you can always listen to them. But uh, yeah, good. That's a great. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, actually, that <clears throat> that ties in really well with with one other topic I wanted to cover um, in our conversation, which is you know the your personal growth in the coffee community the growth of your presence in the coffee community and the growth of the zine even since the last time that we spoke uh i remember around the time that that we spoke with you i remember very vividly that you put out an editor's note on in in one of the most recent zines at that time um where you were very honest about how it was very hard for you to to find that organic growth and it's you know it was really hard to support the zine and support yourself and figure out kind of how like where your personal journey was taking you um and i and, and at least from an outsider's perspective it seems like uh you've really continued to flourish in the coffee space um be it, just even listening to your introduction where you talked about all the different things you do um from your perspective is is it as uh has it been as as wild of a ride as it seems from the outside like how have how have things been for you yeah that's a great question it has been a wild ride for sure um and i'm constantly i'm I'm working on this but i'm constantly second guessing myself and wondering, is this what I should be doing? Should I be doing that? Should I be focusing on this more? Should I be focusing on that? 
um, all while just trying to like have a good time and <laughs> enjoy, you know, my day to day existence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's a hard, a really hard balance to strike with enjoying, at least it, in my experience, it's been difficult to strike a balance between enjoying the day to day and having a, a trajectory into the future. Um, both just with my personal life and with the zine. Um, yeah, because it, it is, it, I'm enjoying it for sure. And I'm really Mm. glad and really thankful for my time in Hawaii and really glad that I've been doing the zine. Um, but it is, it's a struggle as a freelancer, as a self-employed person. Uh, the zine is still not quite making enough money for me to fully like just live off of the zine. Um, and that's something that I've, I've waffled back and forth. Like one month I'll be like, yeah, I, I just want to do the zine. I want this to be my primary income. Like, I'm just going to push it and make it, you know, make this my, my one and only thing and stop trying to, you know, stop using my time to do like other freelance stuff. Uh, And then the next month I'll be like, you know what? I think I'd rather be like fully freelance and make my money through writing for other people, consulting, doing other stuff. And the zine can just be like the fun side thing that like, yeah, can maybe make a little bit of income, but it's not like, I'm not reliant on it. And so I go back and forth, which just Mm. like (laughs) ends up being kind of a confusing. And I don't know if it, it sets me back because then I am focusing my time and energy on different things at different times. Well, well, the hyper, the hyper analysis of it doesn't help. I know it, Kevin and I, uh, I, I, I can certainly speak for myself. I think I can speak for Kevin when I say that we also struggle with that pretty significantly. Um, there's always that question of like, wow, you know, I spent like, at least for us, like, you know, we, we have, uh, nine to five jobs that aren't coffee related right now. And, we always ask ourselves, you know, gosh, I spend 45 hours a week doing my, you know, my day job, making a living for myself so that I can do this, the the coffee collective on nights and weekends because I love it, because it's a passion of mine, because I want to see it grow and maybe one day have it be my full time job. Um, and there's that constant like jumping off point that you have to check yourself on. That's like mm-hmm. if I had 45 hours a week free to spend on the zine or to spend on coffee collective, would I be able to grow it in such a way that I can make up at least, you know, let's call it 80% of my income. Yeah. It's really, it's really difficult because like, that's a huge, that's a huge stretch and it's, and it's scary and it's, it's so many things. But, um, for, for me on the outside looking in, like, over the last year, it seems like if I were to think about prominent people in the coffee scene right now, I would think of uh, the first people that come to my mind are like the Cat and Cloud, like, you know, Jared Truby, Chris Baca, right? I would mm-hmm. think of James Hoffman. I would think of uh, Umeko Motoyoshi. I would think of... Carlos Sims Jr., Mm -hmm. Kenny Baker, and Kat Melheim falls in that group of people, and Mm -hmm. you know, I it's so like I mean that that's that's not uh, a question that is a uh, you know a testament to you know how I I believe in what you're doing. I love what you're doing. Um, So yeah, I I think we talk a lot about you know, the struggle of doing what you love versus making a living on this podcast a lot and creativity and mental health surrounding it. Um, so I see you Kat Melheim and I appreciate what you do. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, I can't speak for most of those other people, but Umeko and I have talked a little bit and we both, um, we both are freelance, you know, small business owners and, we do have, you know, somewhat of a platform, this, um, you know, presence out in the, in the coffee world. And we're both like grinding and struggling to like, you know, push our, push our businesses forward and, Mm -hmm. and just to make it by. And, um, 
I, again, I can't speak for anyone else specifically, but I know that I know a number of like freelance creatives that we all have this. And I, maybe you get this too, being, um, I mean, your podcast is, is well listened to and uh, oh, really, you. it's really great production value wow. and everything. Um, so I don't thank know you. if you feel this as well, but sometimes I think that people are like the public have this vision of like, oh, it must be easy. Oh, you must just like love it every single second. Whereas, <laughs> yeah, like, like you were saying, it's a, it's a struggle to like, is like, could, can I make this? my right. real thing can, yeah. can i make it by with just this and other people might just assume that you know you're you're doing great you're it's easy and you're like oh it's <laughs> it's harder than it looks but it's also fun but it's also really hard but yes. i don't yeah. want to be ungrateful but i it also can be <laughs> both yeah yep. for sure it's allowed to be both and yeah. Yeah. people sometimes struggle with that mm-hmm. agreed um I have a really great question for you. I actually am totally kicking myself for not asking it last week, and I'm probably still going to ask it of last week's guest, Felicity Jones, who owns Superior Merchandise. But you mentioned Umeko Motoyoshi. Obviously, Matt and I look up to you, um, Umeko, uh, Lisa Farr. You know, there's a lot of really great women business owners in coffee, and it's actually International Women's Month this month, which I, I thought was super cool. Like, this is the first time I've actually seen it publicly pronounced as you know international women's month um which kind of got my gears turning so i'm you know good job society um but i i wanted to ask this question specifically in a lot of ways like it, it feels like we still as an american society as a u.s society we haven't had a female ownership boom um do you have any advice for potential business owner operator women as someone who is a business owner operator woman well i would i would i would almost like take that question and switch it around and mm -hmm. like more address consumers and like mm. I, and in in terms of like your purchasing habits be more aware of where you're buying stuff yeah like and it kind of it kind of makes me it reminds me of like after um, after last summer when there were like the Black Lives Matter protests and there was mm -hmm. this huge push to support black owned businesses. And mm -hmm. I've heard from some of my friends who are um, black business owners that that was great for two weeks, three weeks, mm -hmm. maybe a couple of months. And then that waned. And then in February of this year, which is Black History Month, people were talking about black businesses again. And then in March now people are talking about women owned businesses mm. and the black owned businesses are kind of like, you know, put on hold again. Um, so I would say as really, yeah, I would prefer to address consumers and say like every month, every day, every purchase, be aware and be cognizant and be intentional with where you're buying your coffee, where you're buying your products. Um, oh, and then also like, so this also reminds me of like um, the support now being um, being brought attention to Asian owned businesses after um, yes. after all of the uh, Asian American hate that has been going on. Um, so mm -hmm. people are like, you know, support Asian owned businesses. Like these are things that we should be thinking about, not just when it's Black History Month, Women's History Month, or when a tragedy happens to a, a community, but we should be. And I would encourage people to um, look at, yeah, who you're supporting with every purchase and just make sure that you're supporting yes. folks who are who are doing it right, folks who need, um, not folks who need, but uh, folks who are from historically marginalized communities, business mm -hmm. owners um, who who deserve your money because yes. Yeah. Because they're business owners. <laughs> yeah. The big word that you used there was intention. Be intentional. And it, it honestly, it seems like it takes a little bit of extra work up front to be intentional. Mm -hmm. um, but that the payoff for everyone is greater in the long run. Mm -hmm. And that, at least for me, that has opened my eyes to so many different and new things that I would never have experienced beforehand. So like when I travel, I love 
to like get food at different places. Like I love eating food <laughs> basically. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, obviously since COVID, I haven't really traveled that much, but I did get to go to Hawaii. And so one of the first things that I did is I was like looking up like black owned restaurants <gasps> and there aren't That's awesome. that many in Hawaii, but it brought me to different places that I wouldn't have gone or even here in Minneapolis. Um, mm. Like instead of, instead of just like getting the pizza that's closest, I live kind of in the suburbs. Um, so instead of getting like the pizza that's closest or like the food that's closest, I'll drive a half an hour into the city to support mm -hmm. a, a black owned business. And also like food that I wouldn't have had otherwise. That's absolutely delicious. Mm. It's super tasty. Um, <laughs> like, you know, I'm again, I'm in the suburbs, so what's here is limited. Yeah. Um, and that that just opens my eyes, my palate, my experience to so much more than what I would otherwise just be consuming. i I think another way of saying what you said about um, intentionally supporting businesses and and, and paying attention to where, you are spending your money is that you're right like <laughs> uh, I, I think one of the most important changes we can make as a society that is consuming uh, so much is that in especially today you have so much power with your dollar um, you your dollar can be used in such an intentional way um, and it's incredibly like you said it's incredibly important to like figure out where you're going to be spending your money how you're spending your money um we one thing that comes up in my head when, when i think about this is that quality is pretty easy to come by now uh and i think the most powerful statement that you can make from like a political or socioeconomic standpoint is with your dollar uh is using this like weird imperfect capitalist system that we have to make your voice heard and there are so many more avenues for like human like individual you know regular human beings making an impact using the dollar whether it's grassroots donations to political organizations um uh or nonprofit organizations or deciding to spend money uh, at one visit, one business versus another, in order to you know empower and um, strengthen a certain you know marginalized community. Let's say, I think that's really cool that that you put th put it that way. I actually I appreciate that answer. Let's pivot a little bit. I I have something that I wanted to ask you about uh, that I've been seeing in your pictures of you being outside, socially distanced away from people. One thing that you have had in your hand recently uh, are cans of these sparkling botanicals. <laughs> what what yeah. is up with that? Those look delicious. <laughs> they are so tasty. So uh, Rishi Tea, they yeah. are like a, a tea company, and they recently came out with these sparkling botanicals, which are non-alcoholic um, sparkling tea drinks, mm. basically. So speaking um, my language, yeah, they're they're really good. And the thing that I love about them is that they aren't sweetened so they don't have any added sugars um, or any sugar at all which is really hard to come by so it's kind of like I don't know I don't like to really compare it to a LaCroix because LaCroix it's is not. more fruity right yeah. and these are more <laughs> tea like um, yeah, they're, yeah they're botanicals so yeah. but yeah they're really good they're really refreshing um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Rishi, they reached out to me and were like, hey, we'd love to send you, you know, a box of this to try and, you know, let us know what you think about it. Um, oh. And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. And then they sent it to me. I was like, oh, wow, this good. is really good. Yeah. And so, yeah, they're, they're really good for, I mean, when I was on the beach, they were super good because they were super refreshing. Yeah. But yeah, I like it because it's not super full of sugar. It's not super sweet. Um, I have... Mm -hmm an insatiable sweet tooth that I have been constantly trying to fight like <laughs> for my whole life. I, I, I cannot overcome this, this sweet tooth. Um, but, uh, so what I like about them is that they don't offset my sweet tooth. Like oh. it, it gives me something that doesn't make me crave more sweetness. 
Um, and it's also non-alcoholic. So it, you mm. know, I can have, you can have it at 10 AM noon four, six, you can have it at any time. Yeah. And yeah, that, that's something like, I really love flavors and mm-hmm. the flavors of sparkling alcohol drinks are sometimes really great, but mm-hmm. I'm like, but I don't really want to drink right now. So mm-hmm. they're a great option for that. And a great option for someone like myself who's not drinking at all. So yeah, I was, yeah. that really piqued my interest. I was like, Ooh, non-alcoholic sparkling botanicals. I'm in. Yeah. yeah. Not a sponsor. <laughs> yeah, not a yeah. No. <laughs> what, sponsor what's, us. Uh, speaking of beverages, what's in your mug? Well, my mug is pretty nearly empty right now. This yeah. is like my very last sip. Nice. That's the end of it. Uh, this was an Ecuador uh, double home ferment from Royal uh, Coffee uh, oh, Importers. Yeah. So I, as I mentioned a couple of times, I do some consulting. So I recently did a consultation where I hooked up some folks that I've been working with, um, with Royal to do a sensory training mm-hmm. and, um, Royal sent us there. They're in Oakland. Um, and Candace Madison, shout out to Candace. She's like the speaking of roasting. She's like yeah. the top. She is roasting goals. She's my roasting hero. Whoa. Um, but, um, so she roast, I think she roasted this, but, uh, it was part of this sensory, kit that we did for for this consulting gig that i had um and it is absolutely delicious and wonderful Mm, that's awesome double home ferment yeah so they i think that they were describing it as um a lot of the farmers in that area are smallholder farmers and so there's a push to teach them certain um home home fermenting techniques so that they can get a, a higher price for their coffee when they sell it um, uh, so that they so that the quality is higher yeah you got to compete in that anaerobic market right now <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing we could spend hours talking oh. about is fermentation um, yeah. because yeah when i was in hawaii i got to see a bunch of different like fermentation experiments in like tiny small batches, like 20 pounds, 30 pounds, 40 pounds of small fermentation. And I was listening to, um, I don't know if you know, uh, Lucia Solis, she's a coffee fermentation expert. Mm -hmm. Um, she's in Colombia right now, um, but lives half of the year in Ohio. But anyway, she has a podcast called making coffee with Lucia Mm -hmm. Solis. And I listened to that as I was working on the farm, like, and it was just another level of of knowledge that I was gaining because like listening, I feel like listening to an an education podcast is one thing, but listening to it while you're immersed in that subject yeah. matter, like I was able to absorb so much more. Um, it's almost like taking a course. Yeah, one hundred percent. yeah, or learning learning a language by being immersed in it. I was learning coffee fermentation language by being immersed in it um so yeah anyway fermentation is a whole thing we could go on yeah yeah i, I perk i perked up you said fermentation <laughs> that time. i was like are we doing oh, this oh yeah <laughs> what do you got <laughs> two hour podcast no uh, <laughs> so we're super duper um i mean the whole coffee space is super mega amped on fermentation right now there's all these like you know how there's like funny memes out there right now like anaerobie like yeah <laughs> like every everything's like oh like i want my anaerobie and uh-huh. i mean i'm i'm in on it i love it i think it's really cool naturals have a really interesting flavor profile even the naturals that get like wicked boozy i think that's pretty cool um it's just you know it's just another dimension that we're all kind of digging into in this weird space that we all love yeah. um kevin that brings me to what's in our mugs what do we got what is in our mugs matt our mugs. All right, so I'll tell you. So, uh, we're ob- so we're drinking our highlight roasts, and for yeah. for people who don't know, kind of what that is, we um, we financially back uh, roasters in our area. Usually, we're, right now, we're focusing on just our state of New York. And what we do is we come to them and we say, like, you know, hey, are there any are there any coffees out there that like you're really amped on that you would love to work on that you love to roast, but maybe aren't necessarily 
um, comfortable making that, yeah, comfortable making that like financial risk because it's like a really expensive coffee. Um, we'll work with you. We'll market it. We'll guarantee that we, we usually buy a guaranteed 50 bags of it. And mm -hmm. then we sell it on our site with like an education package around it. And, um, it, we hype it up as a drop because we're only doing like 50 bags. And then when they're gone, um, then that coffee company can do whatever they want to do with the rest of the coffee. So this was uh, a coffee from the El Vergel Estates in Colombia, produced mm -hmm. by uh, Shadi and Elias Biter. Mm -hmm. um, they are two young guys. They're like my age. They're like, you know, 27, 28 years old. Um, they inherited a, a few hectares of land, and in Colombia, uh, as some people might know, um, they generally uh, are, I would say, like elders or, or people who have been in the Colombian coffee industry for a long time, um, usually advise people to buy or sorry, grow their coffee and sell it as commodity coffee. Just go to market and sell it, you know. Don't do anything crazy. Don't mess around. Well, Elias and Shadi were experimenting with, um, pr you know, fa different kinds of specialty coffee processing because they got to taste specialty coffee and they fell in love with it. So um, mm -hmm. this is kind of like a two years in um, final, but always in, you know, always in progress product called Guava Banana. It's a double fermented uh, Katura mm. coffee. Oh, dang. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really good. They they uh, aerobically ferment it in um, like wide and short tanks, expose it to oxygen for like six or 12 hours, just really kickstart the fermentation process. And then they submerge it in cold water for any idea, Kev? Up to two weeks. Up to two weeks or something like that yeah. in, in an anaerobic fermentation. And then they yeah. do this crazy thing where they like, they like dry it, uh, you know, on, they, they just dry it in open air beds, but then they put it in a vault and then they bring it back out. They do like this sort of like cycled drying process. The whole thing takes like almost two months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's nuts. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. And uh, we finally, we released it on Friday, two Fridays ago. Mm -hmm. And we just shipped out a bunch yesterday. We've just been drinking the shit out of it. It tastes like guava, mm -hmm. but uh, I was almost said banana, guava, banana. It tastes like guava, <laughs> mango, tropical yeah. fruit punch. It's that sounds honey. so flippin' tasty. Uh, guava is one of my favorite fruits. Mm. Yeah, guava is amazing. It's got that really nice juicy flavor to it. Yeah. Yeah, this is... I, oh know. man, my mouth is watering just thinking about this. Yes. It's that's it's really, the goal. Really good. That's what yeah. we want to do. This year, we we decided we were only really going to like, we were we were going to approach roasters and say, hey, let's try to get something that's like really unique, really different. You totally. know, totally. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah, this blend we have on our website is like super approachable. So because we have that like approachable entry point to coffee, we we figured we might as well double down on it and. Do some pretty crazy coffees for the Highlight Row series. So. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, and then last question, last but not least, probably the most important question of the entire podcast every time we podcast. Uh, what's your jam, Cap? What have you been listening to? Any artist or band or album or anything? Yeah. So for, <laughs> for the zine, uh, each issue, I compile a, like a list, a playlist, basically, of coffee people artists mm -hmm. um, that have music. And so I just finished putting together uh, Coffee People Music Volume 8. It's My original idea was for it to be kind of like a, now that's what I call music yeah. but for <laughs> coffee people. So I just put together Volume 8 and there are some amazing artists on there. Um, I have to super shout out to my friend Emma Reeves. Um, she is in Portland, Oregon, and she doesn't have her music on Spotify, but she has it on SoundCloud under wow. the name First Alternate. Okay. So everybody look up First Alternate on SoundCloud. Um, her her song, what's it called? Best Best Clothes is best, like Best Clothes. Best Best Clothes is so my jam right now. Um, like, yeah, I I've, I've listened to it on repeat. I can't I don't even know how much. Um, but it's just like such a, it's like a 
feel good. Just like you can have it on in the background while you're doing other stuff, or you Mm. can like listen to it full on. Like it's just great. Um, And then she also did background vocals for, so she's a co-owner of push pull in Portland. Um, Mm. If you, they, they are a really cool roaster that, mostly focuses on naturals and funky fermentation. So oh, cool. circling back around to that. Um, yeah. But uh, her, her business partner, Christopher, he's the co-owner and roaster there. He also has a music project um, called, oh, I'm going to forget it. It starts with a K. Um, I can look it up. But uh, he has a music project as well. And that is on the, um, on the, zine like on the album as well um he has a he has a spotify uh i should i should find it yeah take your time looking it up we'll 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 say our jams and then we'll circle back yeah you say your jams and i'm gonna look it up yeah matt what's your jam buddy all right this one's coming out of left field i found this kevin you know i usually just stick to like three or four records and then just like put them on repeat over year over year (laughs) but uh, I was listening, so you know I love Phoebe Bridgers. I was listening oh, yeah. to Phoebe Bridgers and got to the point where I had listened to like all of the songs that she has to offer on Spotify, and Spotify started to just like recommend like you know similar artists. And lo and behold, uh, Phoebe Bridgers and Connor Oberst of Bright Eyes did a collaboration project in 2019 called Better Oblivion Community Center, and it's friggin i mean it's fantastic it's fantastic folk it's like my two favorite folk artists ever uh and in fact i did learn that um phoebe bridgers like as she like came up in music one of her like big influences was bright eyes so i think it's really cool that she got to then collaborate with connor oberst and they they did this really interesting funky kind of folk album and it's just self-titled that's cool. Yeah, so I've been jamming that. Nice, man. What That's about been you, pretty Kev? dope. Uh, well, I have been <laughs> I've been when I'm not working or like doing anything creative right now. I've been at the gym a lot and I've been running again because it's like warm weather outside, which means yeah. I am totally immersed in like metal and math metal and prog oh, metal yeah. right now. But pump uh, up yeah one of my favorite yeah. uh local i would say local because they're from southern new york but they play up here all the time uh outfits is called johnny booth and they have oh, a yeah. really awesome progressive message to their music of course it's coming across in the vein of metal you know so like really like when you have like a softer artist who's being progressive there's a lot of like they're channeling a lot of like angst and empathy and you know positivity toward the end or like hopefulness or you know maybe attempting to uh you know get some of the remorse of being progressive out and about but uh with johnny booth or with like a metal band a lot of times what you have is like angst in the form of just like sarcasm and irreverence and like just really powerful wording and like energy coming through the speakers at you and their new song crowd control is super dope and really it gets into like um you know it's very anti-establishment but it's like super 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 progressive and just like really gets me pumped up and i've been jamming that nonstop. (laughs) love it yeah okay i found the one that i was looking for um so it is the music project is called kindly K I N D L Y. Okay. Uh huh. And the song's Bubbles. Bubbles. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. awesome. Yeah. So that's brought to you by the uh, by the ownership team over at Push Pull in Portland. Um, yeah, they're super rad. Oh, and then another artist that I've been listening to a lot is Takobi Hines. Um, he is a coffee person manager out in California. Mm-hmm. I should know this off the top of my head, but I forgot. Um, but yeah, Tacoby Hines, uh, T E C O B Y is his first name, and Hines, H I N E S. Uh, his music is just absolutely spectacular. Like, yeah. so, 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 so great. Um, and he has a couple of albums, a couple of EPs that he just put out recently. Um, 
and highly, highly recommend listening to, to him. Nice. To Kobe Hines, kindly and uh, first alternate. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's a good group of jams. <laughs> well, I'm super pumped about that cat. Um, any, any closing thoughts for the coffee world as we move into the last week of March this year, March, March ahead. Um, <laughs> yeah. March uh, ahead. Right. Yeah. That's all. That's all I can say. <laughs> Boom. Buy the um, zine. Get the, get a subscription. Yes. Oh, get hell yeah. Coffee yeah. Let's plug that quick. Zine. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, people, uh, where can people find you? On Empathy. Instagram at coffee people zine, uh, mm-hmm. follow us over there. And then the link in bio has links to the subscriptions and, and the uh, one-off issues. We just released issue 12, um, like a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks Bloom. ago. Um, yes. Issue 12 uh. bloom. Um, it's, I mean, it's always hard. Cause I'm like, Oh, it's my favorite issue. I feel like every new issue is my favorite issue. They just like, it just keeps getting better and better. Um, and yeah, I, I love this issue. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, we have a, an extended section with features of, um, trans artists, trans and non-binary artists in oh, collaboration yes. with the trans and caffeinated podcast. Um, I love that. so everyone should go listen to that and then, yeah, check out the feature in issue 12. Um, the art, I mean, it's just absolutely gorgeous and wonderful and beautiful. Um, what was the name of that podcast one more time? Trans and caffeinated. I'm lo- I'm looking that up right now. Yeah, do it. Yeah. It's run by uh, my friend Ariel Rebecca. She is a trans advocate and coffee person, um, awesome. living in Chicago currently. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, but she interviews uh, trans folks about their experience, about their lives, um, and then has the background of being in coffee. Whoa! I 100. So and and then you have a featured section in Bloom. Yeah, yeah, it's a oh. about a third of the entire zine. Uh, it, we did we dedicated to this featured section. So um, Ariel uh, reached out to people, and and I reached out to trans and non-binary artists that I know as well, because um, some folks have submitted to past issues. And then we put together, yeah, just this like feature section that really like holds space for and celebrates the joy of of trans folks. Um, oh my god! Yeah, it's really great because I mean. Ariel and I were talking and she, you know, mentioned that a lot of people only hear about like trans folks in terms of uh, like the, the pain and the discrimination and the harassment mm-hmm. and which is all a, a huge part of, uh, can be a huge part of folks experience, but that there isn't often much conversation about the joys of that trans yeah. people have. And, uh, you know, just like every day, like, we are also we are people, and so we yeah. and we experience joy. Um, so it's a celebration right. of that, and and really holding space for, um, yeah, just the experience of joy. That it doesn't like being trans doesn't have to always be terrible. And of course, not to discount the pain and harassment that they do face, um, but yeah, just a, a highlight of joy and beauty and wonderful. Oh, that's great. That that plucks my heartstrings. That's I I absolutely love stuff like that. It makes me so happy. Like I cry like happy tears. Like I'm such a sap when it comes to stuff like that. I'm just like, oh my god, there's actually hope in the world. It's beautiful. Yeah, I I literally when I was reading and looking through some of that work, I did cry happy oh, tears. Um, it's the best. Both, both Ariel and I did looking through it. Yeah, it's just go- it's gorgeous work. Um, so yeah, everyone should get that issue twelve. Um, mm-hmm. you can get it on the website. Yeah. Go, go to the Instagram and then go, the website is coffeepeople.org. Um, mm-hmm. and you can buy it through there. You can either buy it like a one-off issue or subscribe. Subscriptions are the best way, uh, yeah. to support me and, um, and the zine. Uh, also I have a Patreon if people want to support me through that. Um, yeah. and that's coffee people zine Patreon. You can also get that through the link in bio at the coffee people zine. Instagram. Yeah, and if they wanted to do that, that would essentially subscribe them to Coffee People Zine. Yeah, at the at Good. a certain level, uh, yeah. at the the fifteen dollar a month level, you get yeah. a subscription. Okay. So that's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, so if people wanted to support you and Coffee People Zine at the same time, the best way to do that is through that Patreon. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Yep. 
one hundred percent. Great. Yeah. Well, Kat, thanks for joining us again. We'll have to have you on to talk about funky fermentation. And <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah, we'll have to do round three. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're always welcome, of course. Uh, we've got all of the, all that information that you gave us. We'll throw in the link in the bio, or link in bio, <laughs> the link in our description. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, have a great Sunday. Uh, yeah, happy Palm Sunday, y'all. Yeah. Go <laughs> lay down some palms. Peace.